I'm, I'm kind of curious, what, what was the advice that I gave you? Because I could probably use it right now. Uh, it was, uh, in 10 seconds, it was, it was Inc. 500, it was Super Bowl Sunday, we were both speaking, and I walked out there, I was like, there's four people in the audience, because it's Super Bowl Sunday, and he said, give them your passion, they've come a long way to hear you, and I talked to them as if it was four people in the room, as opposed to a big room, and it was like, right. well, talk Well, I'm to gonna people. talk to you all as if there are four people in the talk room. Talk to people! How about that, all right? So what we do is I lead a research institute of human behavior change. Basically, it's this. How many people in this room, just raise your hands if you in this room would like to change somebody else's behavior. Raise your hands. <laughs> Good. Well, you're about to hear how that happens, all right? And I take out your pens and paper because this is 10 years of research that I'm going to try to give you in less than 14 minutes and 35, 34 seconds at this point in time, all right? So with that in mind, let me just start with the, the most obvious comment, and that is that for those of you who are trying to change people in organizations, here's a piece of advice. Organizations don't change. Cultures don't change. People change inside of organizations, right? So that's an important thing. And here's the other thing to know, is that people really kind of don't change very easily, all right? And here's the other thing. People don't change until their practices change. What I mean by that is people don't change until they do something differently in a repeated enough set of practices that it becomes a new habit. Does that make sense to you? So what you're really trying to do is you're trying to figure out how to change people's practices and then in a sustainable way until they become a habit. The problem is they've got other habits today. Their habits today are their old familiar habits, their old familiar practices, which they've been doing so long that frankly they are addictive. Now, I'm going to use this word, and I use it even with Fortune 500 companies, because people are addicted to old behaviors. Every one of you in this room, by the way, has an addiction. And I'm not just talking about smoking and drinking and drugs and sex and all the kind of good stuff. I'm talking about the kind of addictions that are your glass ceilings, the kind of practices that you practice and you let yourself down. The procrastination, the, the fear of interaction with people, the, the, the bragging, the temper. These are just addictive behaviors. And the reason I use the word addiction is because they can't be treated lightly. If you want to change one of your old familiar practices or behaviors, it's tough like it is to change any other behavior, like it is to change any other addiction. So what I'm about to show you is something that we apply with a lot of organizations. We also apply it to kids and teens. And I've, I want to show you my son, Daniel. Now, this was not particularly a good day. This is Daniel when he came into our home at 12 years of age as a foster child. 80% of the U.S. prison population came from foster care. 80% of the U.S. prison population came from foster. Their habits and rituals and practices and behaviors of distrust, of pushing people away before other people will hurt them, lead them out into the workplace, lead them out into the world incapable of and, and, and struggling and challenged with being able to build the kind of relationships that they need. If any of you in this room have an empty bedroom and an open heart and would like to make a difference in the world, in society, and in a child's life, consider foster care yourself and come and talk to me. Our foundation focuses a great deal on it. And what we do is we focus on applying our human behavior change methodology to kids as well as to large corporations like General Motors and others. Right? So with that in mind, I want to show you, after a lot of pain, where Daniel is today. And that's my boy. This is at 15. And I, I'm going to take that back because the applause isn't for me, it's for him. Because Daniel's taught me in the last three years more than I've ever learned. Let me show you the philosophy and the strategy for human behavior change. The first thing that everybody here has to recognize, and I want you to do this. Let's get practical, let's get serious. Think of someone's behavior that you'd like to change. Think of an organization or a team's behavior that you'd like to change. Now the first thing you have to recognize is that you're not going to change them ubiquitously. The best thing you can do is ask yourself a simple question. What is the highest return simple practice that you can begin to work on getting this person to change? that could begin to be the tipping point, that could begin to be the taste of a new set of experiences, that could begin to do something small that will give hope and aspiration that the rest of the behaviors will change. Organizations that try to do these BS culture projects where they come along and they think that communications and training is sufficient 
to change behavior is a whitewash situation. What they're basically saying is just because you know what you got to do, you're going to do it, which we know isn't true. If that were true, nobody on a diet would eat a ho-ho, right? But we do. So with that in mind, what you've got to think about is what is the smallest little pinpricky practice that can change? Some people talk about collaboration in corporations. They've been talking about we got to collaborate across silos and divisions for years and ain't nothing happening. But if you say to somebody, let's use the staff meeting to talk about something instead of just going around and reading to each other and reporting out. That's collaboration. That's a new practice to put in place. Instead of... Uh, Instead of being at a large corporation where multiple brands acting like multiple brands, before you go on to your next sales call, pick up the damn phone and call one of the other brands and do a brainstorming session before you go in. That's a practice. And little by little, you can begin to see that a practice, and what you want to do is you want to pick the highest return practices that will give you the best outcome. For Daniel, it was, kiddo, tell your story with pride. Now that was too big, that's a behavior. Having pride and self-esteem was a big deal. But I said, I hear you, you're a great rapper. Let's, let's let you rap. And so I got him a rap coach, and then with that rap coach, little by little, and the rap coach was nothing more than this really cool, dreadlocked 24-year-old guy that I met, and I was like, do you like to rap? And he's like, yeah, I like to rap. And I'm like, okay, so I'm gonna hire you as a rap coach. He's like, and, and you can move into my home in Beverly Hill, I mean, in, in the Hollywood Hills in Los Angeles, and you can live with us and travel all around the world and teach my kid rap. Is that good for you? He's like, yeah, I'm down for that. This is good, good for me, <laughs> right? So he taught my kid how to do a single rap song that told his story with not shame that he was sublimating and, and fearful of, but with pride, so he puts his story out there. And he, then he learned to trust someone. He learned to trust Malcolm which he's never trusted before, over a sustainable period of time, the nose of Malcolm wasn't going to leave him, right? So now you're dealing with practice orientation. So the first thing you've got to think about in changing anybody is what is the first, simplest, highest return, positive practice that you can change in that individual? The next thing you've got to do, and this is a big one, and that is that you've got to open up what we call porosity. It's a metric that we've created, and it means the, the person's willingness, the sponginess, the capacity for influence. That's the porosity. Now, what we know is that porosity goes through a series of, 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 of mind cycles. The first one that doesn't usually work that most people use is people say, what are the consequences if I don't change? So as a result, that's the sort of like, I told you so. I told you to change. We know that doesn't work, right? Do we know that that works? I told you to change. No. The next thing that doesn't change that well, but our mind goes through is, well, why should I? And this is really more about the logical reasons to change. It's interesting because most businesses rely mostly on the you should and here's why you should. And that's where they leave off on their explanation. But when actual, what's really going on in our mind that begins to get us a possibility of change are the other people. First, just, first of all, is this going to make me more joyful? Bottom line. Is it going to make me more joyful? If you can get somebody to believe that the change you want them to make is going to make them more joyful, make it easier in their life, etc. then you start getting their attention. The next question is, will it ignite some passion of theirs? Now, the problem is most companies can't pull that lever because there is no passion in their companies. On the other hand, i got a good buddy of mine, Tony Shea from Zappos, who created an organization around passion. If you want to get somebody to change at Zappos, you just let, mention the passion of the customer. And we're doing it for the customer, and they get ignited and ready to go. But finally, the way people change is to belong. We are tribal animals, instinctive 70,000 years ago, hardwired to be a part of something, and the problem is in the last 20 to 30 years, we are a part of less and less and less. Our families don't eat together, our clubs don't have the same meaning, our organizations come and go, we're all virtual, all of these things are going on. If you can tap into a sense of belonging in somebody, they're going to want to change, because that's the deepest core anthropological sense of meaning and desire. So that, with that in mind, here I give you a couple of tips to make people go up that scale. First of all, you don't shame them. You don't shame somebody in the belonging and passion, which is what most organizations do. How dare you? You should be doing this. You know, what did you, why wouldn't you do this? You don't shame. The other thing is start opening up some transparency that, people, some transparency that makes people think that, that you've, you're real. Talk about the pink elephants. Levity and fun opens up porosity and possibility. Ask them if they're willing to change. A simple lever to to begin to open up porosity with an individual. And here's the other one, be vulnerable yourself. 
The worst thing is a leader or somebody that wants somebody to change who's standing up saying, I'm perfect and you need to change. The great leaders are the ones who can open up a sense of, we need to change. And, he, and I understand I'm, teaching, I'm t- asking you to do something tough, but I need to do something tough, and this is what I need to do, and this is what you need to do, and together we're going to fulfill possibility with mutual change. I could go through a number of other areas. The other thing is you've got to give people choice as to what they change. You don't be prescriptive. They won't listen to that. So all of that is under the bundle called opening up porosity in another individual. Then what you've got to do is you've got to enlist them into a community of others. I told you that the greatest sense of, of, of desire to change is for a group to be a part of an in-group. Not an out-group, but an in-group. And the distinction is that we do things for an in-group we wouldn't do for the out-group. Problem is today that most of us are walking around in our own in-group and everybody else is a part of our out-group because we don't have practice being tribal and connected like we used to. So you've got to give them an aspiration that if they do this and then you start gathering people around them. So I started a foundation called Words to Life, which you can look it up online, for Daniel and other foster kids and other inner city kids that will rap together and they think they're learning how to be rappers. I'm teaching them life skills. But it doesn't matter. There's now a community of kids doing it together. Now there's some aspiration of a role model community. Ultimately, you've got to recognize that 70% of the reason we change is because we tried something and liked it. So that's why we go to the practices, because you want to get somebody to try something and like it. 70% of the reasons we change is we tried something and liked it, and we tried it repeatedly and liked it and liked it, and we kept wanting more. That was the addictive behavior. 20% of the way we change is because we were coached into changing by somebody who gave a damn about us. Only 10% of the reason we change is by training, by knowledge. And you take a look at our education system, and it's, it's not coaching and experience. It's teaching. It's teaching. It's instruction. You take a look at what most organizations do is they put communication strategies together and they put training programs together, neither of which work. It's a tell people what to do strategy. None of those penetrate the human behavior change methodology of 10 years of study and both from deep academic rigor as well as experiential learning. Is this making sense to you? Let me tell you the final lever. The final lever is having that group around you that really cares. So the group on the right is my mother's card club. That's my mom there on the left, Nancy. Nancy's been in the same card club for 45 years. They meet every month. Unfortunately, the picture on the left was a number of them a number of years ago before a number have passed away. As my mom jokes, they keep having to refine different card games that they can play with fewer and fewer of the card club members. She says that uh, one of these days she knows that one of them's going to be sitting around thinking about the others playing solitaire. But I asked my mom, I said, tell me about your card club. And my mom explained to me about how when my father was unemployed, when I grew up in Pittsburgh, my pop was a steel worker, my mom was a cleaning lady, And she talked to me about how when we were unemployed eating what was called welfare cheese back then, which was just these big lumps of big gross Velveeta stuff, and that the card club girls every day would make more food and bring food down to us. She talks about how my pop, when he passed away, how that group, when, and she said, Keith, you were so wonderful, but, you know, even you got back to your life after a few months, and Everybody gets back to their life, and here I was alone in my house. The worst time, by the way, for those of you who have parents who have lost a a spouse is that three months after when the world has gotten back to their own work and they're alone in their home. But the card club girls took turns every other day doing something with my mom. When my Aunt Wilma was about to pass away, the card club girls decided to cancel card club. They had never done that before. And Aunt Wilma and literally with two days left in her life, said, don't cancel. I'd like you to come over and have card club on my bed, bedside. And they sat there and they said goodbye. And they played cards. And she passed away. And they've still never missed a single card club. This is what we need in our lives. 50% of Americans say that no one has their back. My second book was called Who's Got Your Back? 
teaching us all how we can build the kind of support structure around us that won't let us fail, the kind of peer-to-peer -peer coaching methodology that's sitting in this room for you and with you right now, and you don't even recognize it because you won't let your guards down to the people that love you and to the rest of the world so that they will love you, so that you, you will reach out to the world with a sense of service and generosity that will invite people in, so that you'll be candid in truth-telling, particularly when you don't want to hear it and when they don't want to hear it, but you have to because you love each other. And that's an individual, and that's a group of pe people that have your back. And that's what will help you grow. That's what will help you change. That's what will open up your porosity to hear the truth. That's what will allow you to be coached on a daily basis organically. And if your team as a leader isn't that, shame on you. And if you don't have that in your organization because you've reached around and found that peer group, shame on you. And if your spouse isn't that, shame on the both of you. But you can turn these things around by your willingness to let your guards down and invite people in in more powerful ways and find that lifeline group for every one of you or you won't have the success you won't step up to the new productivity that's available to you you won't have your dreams you will be mediocre but you could have everything you want if you just create your lifelines like my mom good luck god bless <laughs>